A viewer asks, I'm going through the quantity theory of money video and I notice that you outline the following steps. That the money supply times the velocity of money has to be equal to the price level times the real level of output. And then you go on mathematically to say then the percent change of m times v has to equal the percent change in p times y. And then you state that algebraically the percent change in m times v equals the percent change in m plus the percent change in v. And the percent change in p times y is equal to the percent change in p times the percent change in y. The viewer then goes on to point out that he plugged in numbers for m and v and doesn't find that the percent change in m times v is equal to the percent change in m plus the percent change in v. So let's go through an example and let's think about what's going on here because as it turns out, this equality here is only an approximation. So we need to understand what's going on here. The viewer is not wrong as we can see in this example. So let's just say hypothetically that we're increasing m from 100 to 110. That would clearly be a 10% increase. Furthermore, let's say we were increasing v from 20 to 25. That would be an increase of 5 on a base of 20, which is a 25% increase. So if we were to multiply these two things together, we would see that m times v goes from 2,000, which is 100 times 20, to 2750, which is 110 times 25. And if we were to use the percent change formula, which is just final minus initial divided by initial times 100%, we would see that the 2750 minus 2000 divided by 2000 is actually a 37.5% increase rather than a 10 plus 25 which is 35% increase. So the viewer was completely right when he said, well, the math doesn't quite add up here, even though you're stating that these two things are the same. So it's important to keep in mind that this equivalency is actually an approximation. So let's go through the math and understand how this is an approximation and also understand when we can use this approximation as an equality and when we can't. So what I've done here is just set up an algebraic example equivalent to the one we did, just did with numbers. So let's say that m increases by some rate r1. Notice here that r1 is a rate not a percentage so a reasonable value for r1 would be 0 0.05 rather than 5 percent for example. So if m increases by rate r1, then m becomes 1 plus r1 all multiplied by m. And this is just because 1 plus r1 times m is just if you distribute the m, well just m, what you started with, plus the rate of increase times m. Similarly, let's say that v increases by rate r2. Again, R2 would be in decimal form rather than percentage form. And we would say the V turns into 1 plus R2 times V. So if we were to think about then how M times V changes, well, we would just start with M times V, and we would end up with 1 plus R1 times M, which is this first part here, times 1 plus R2 times v, which is the second part here. And then we just rearrange a little bit and we would get that this is just 1 plus r1 times 1 plus r2 all multiplied by mv, which is helpful because we're just looking to see how that coefficient on what we started with is changing. And if we were to just simply use FOIL to multiply this out, we'd say, well, these two terms multiplied together is equal to, well first, 1 times 1, which is 1, plus outer, r2 times 1, which is just r2, plus inner, which is 1 times r1, which is just r1, times last, which is r1 times r2, which is this guy here. So algebraically speaking, the percentage increase in 
mv is equal to this whole thing here, or I should say the rate of increase is equal to this whole thing here. But the simplification that we make when we say that the percent change in two quantities multiplied together is just the sum of the percent changes is when we go from here to here, where we're saying that this is the rate of increase of the product of these two quantities. So what you'll notice that we've done in going from here to here, or in other words, in making this approximation here, is that we've dropped this R1 times R2 term. So it's important to think about, well, when can we actually drop this R1 times R2 term and not have it make much of a difference? Well, mathematically, this term is going to become very small when R1 and R2 are themselves small. In general, it's pretty reasonable to make this approximation when talking about the quantity theory of money because typically the percent changes in the money supply and the percent changes in the velocity of money are very small. So if we're going to think about the equivalent growth rates of those quantities, they're again going to be very small. And this R1 times R2 term is going to be very close to zero. So for the numbers that we're typically dealing with in the quantity theory of money equation, this is a pretty fair simplification or approximation to make. And it's not going to overall affect our answers or our calculations very much. Furthermore, when we're talking about the quantity theory of money, we're actually talking about a situation where, for example, the percent change in the velocity of money is in fact zero. And particularly when we're talking about one of these growth rates being zero, then it's no longer even an approximation. Because if one of these quantities stays constant, then it has to be true that the percent change of the product is exactly equal to the sum of the percent changes.